So, you're sitting at home one day, casually scrolling through Twitter, when suddenly you smell something worse than you ever smelled before. Obviously, the first thing you do is accuse whichever housemate has the worst diet. Unless you live alone, then you're gonna have to look at yourself. But what if the smell doesn't go away, even when you go outside? Well, if you're like the residents of the Sidarojo Regency in eastern Java, Indonesia, you could be unlucky enough to be dealing with a giant mud volcano. Here's what you need to know. 15 years after scalding mud and gas first burst from the ground in Sidarojo in eastern Java, the flow of foul-smelling mud shows no signs of stopping, according to Channel News Asia. The mud now covers an area of more than 6.5 square kilometers or 2.5 square miles and has forced around 60,000 people to leave the area or adapt to the unpleasant environment, with one study cited by CNA showing that the flow releases 100,000 tons of methane every year. The Guardian reports scientists associated with oil and gas company Lapindo Brantas blame an earthquake in Yogyakarta 280 kilometers or 174 miles away for the flow. However, at a 2008 conference in Cape Town of 74 independent petroleum geologists, 42 agreed that drilling had caused the mud flow. Pipes have since been used to redirect mud flow into a nearby river, according to CNA. And in 2006, the Cedarojo Mud Flow Mitigation Center built an embankment around the mud flow site to prevent mud flowing out into surrounding areas. However, issues are still arising. The mud from the burst is about 60,000 to 90,000 cubic meters per day, Patiasina Jeffrey Recchi, head of the Cedarojo Mud Flow Mitigation Center, told CNA this week. This is much more than the 30 million per year that can be diverted into the nearby Porong River. The embankment around the site is also prone to leaking, according to an article in the AIP Conference Proceedings Journal, with Patiasina adding to CNA that it was built in a rush. One strange additional element of the story is the arrival of so-called disaster tourists into the area after the mud began to flow. Some residents who worked at factories swallowed up by the mud became tour guides, according to Reuters, ferrying tourists around the area to get a better look. Around 90% of residents affected by the disaster received some form of compensation in its aftermath, with the Lapindo Brantas ordered to pay 3.8 trillion rupiah, or $415 million, and the Indonesian government also making contributions. That didn't replace the livelihoods lost, though, and so turning to the tourist industry made sense for locals. Of course, disaster tourism is a little more dubious on the part of the tourists. Is it really right to go and take selfies in an area where people have lost their homes? And isn't it especially messed up to do it when the disaster is still ongoing? Where mud is literally still destroying people's lives? Who's to say? But let's just hope these people would be equally as accommodating to people coming to take a look at their destroyed homes if it ever happened to them. Of course, if you are that way inclined and you're looking for a post-COVID holiday, Indonesia is somewhat of a hotspot for major environmental disturbances. President Joko Widodo has announced plans to shift Indonesia's capital city from Jakarta to the province of East Kalimantan on Borneo Island. The Jakarta Post reports that part of the new capital will be in the province's North Penajam Pasir Regency, while the other half will be in the Kutai Kartanegara Regency. The region was chosen for being relatively free from earthquakes and volcanoes. According to Reuters, Indonesia plans to relocate from its current capital, Jakarta, as the city is overpopulated and faces severe congestion. The Guardian reports Jakarta is also sinking 10 to 20 centimeters per year due to severe land subsidence. The Indonesian government said it wants to build a smart, green city. A government official was quoted by the South China Morning Post as saying that they would not disturb any existing protected forest, as the island is filled with tropical rainforests. If President Widodo's plan is approved by the Indonesian parliament, the new capital will begin construction across a plot of about 40,000 hectares next year. In a televised speech, the Indonesian president said that the location is strategic and explained that the shift would ease Jakarta's burden as the center of business, finance, trade, and government. Tragedy has been confirmed in Indonesia after the conclusion of its search for its missing submarine. Here is what we know. 
The Indonesian Navy submarine KRI Nanggala 402 has been found split into three pieces on the ocean floor off the coast of Bali, according to officials. The BBC reports that all of the vessel's 53 crew have been confirmed dead after the three parts were located at a depth of more than 2,700 feet. Working alongside the Indonesian vessel KRI Rigel's sonar scanning operation, the submarine was found by an underwater robot deployed by the Singaporean vessel MV Swift Rescue, according to a report by the Associated press. Hopes of a rescue had already faded after items from the wreckage were found floating up to the ocean surface and were presented by Indonesian officials at a news conference on Saturday, as reported by The Straits Times. Analyzing the likely cause of the sinking, Indonesian Navy Chief of Staff Yudo Margono said that no explosion was believed to have occurred. Instead, heavy water pressure on the vessel likely created a crack in it, according to CNN. The Straits Times notes that the KRI Nangala 402 could withstand water pressure at a depth of up to 500 meters. However, it was not capable of going any deeper. It reports that the Indonesian Navy said on Saturday that contact may have been lost with the vessel at a depth of between 600 and 700 meters, approximately 2,000 and 2,300 feet. Thoughts will now inevitably turn to the reasons behind the sinking. Navy Chief of Staff Yudo Margono said the crew were not to blame for the accident, according to Reuters. Indonesian President Joko Widodo said, All of us Indonesians express our deep sorrow over this tragedy, especially to the families of the submarine crew. Sad news out of Indonesia this week after a plane crashed into the Java Sea. Lion Air Flight JT610 left Jakarta Monday morning at 6.20 a.m., bound for Panggal, Penang. According to Flight Radar 24, Contact was lost with the aircraft not long after takeoff. An Indonesian civil aviation official told the AFP that the Boeing 737 MAX 8 plane was carrying 188 passengers and crew. Indonesia's search and rescue agency told the Jakarta Post that everyone on board is believed to be dead. Citing Indonesian officials, the New Straits Times reports that the plane is believed to have crashed in waters off the island of Java. Debris and airplane seats have been found, as have the remains of some passengers. Citing an online post from Indonesian TV presenter Conchita Caroline, who flew on the plane's penultimate flight on Sunday, the AP reports that she claims that flight was held back for engine checks. The engines used by that Boeing 737 MAX 8 are called CFM-LEAP-1B. Caroline told the New York Times she could see the right engine shaking. According to a July 2017 Lion Air news release, the airline was the first operator of the MAX 8 aircraft in Indonesia. In June 2016, the airline was removed from the EU air safety blacklist. Earlier this year, all Indonesian air carriers were taken off. Quartz reports that the airline had at least 12 incidents since 2002. Most had no casualties, except a 2004 crash that killed 25 people. The deadly tsunami killed at least 373 people and severely damaged infrastructure. A deadly tsunami struck coastal towns on the islands of Sumatra and Java, Indonesia, on Saturday. The tsunami was caused by an eruption from Anak Krakatau, a volcanic island that sits in the Pacific Ring of Fire in the Sunda Strait. According to Reuters, the eruption caused a 64-hectare portion of the volcano to collapse into the ocean, triggering an underwater landslide that would set off the tsunami. No warning system was triggered at the time of the tsunami. Indonesian officials stated that their tsunami buoy network has not been operational since 2012. According to The Guardian, if a buoy network had been installed around Anak Krakatau, it would have given surrounding towns a maximum of one to two minute warnings ahead of pending waves. The tsunami demolished over 700 buildings and left hundreds dead or missing just 24 hours after the volcanic landslide. Anak Krakatau is one of the 76 active volcanoes in Indonesia. With volcanic activity in mind, the state of Hawaii's Emergency Management Agency has a list of items you should include in a go-bag should residents find themselves in an emergency situation. Some of the items on the list include changes of clothes and sturdy shoes, a portable battery or crank-powered radio, a copy of prescriptions, non-perishable foods like energy bars, beef jerky, and nuts, and a whistle. The good thing about that list is that even if nothing bad ever happens, they've got the makings of a great weekend in there. 
The bad thing is that if a new report on Hawaii's giant Moana Loa volcano is correct, the penetrating shrieks of those whistles could be lighting up residents' earlobes any day now. Here's what you need to know. New data has revealed more about what might set off eruptions at the world's largest volcano. In a study published in Nature Scientific Reports, researchers at the Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami modeled movements inside the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii, which, according to the U.S. Geological Survey website, has a summit of 17 kilometers or 56,000 feet above its below seafloor base. The researchers found that while there was recent movement along a fault under the eastern flank, relatively little movement was detected under the western flank. They concluded that an earthquake under the western flank is due. Alongside this, the researchers found that between 2014 and 2020, 0.11 cubic kilometers of new magma pushed its way into a dike-like magma body beneath the south of the volcano summit. Given this magma influx, an earthquake of magnitude 6 or greater could cause an eruption, according to lead author of the study, Bhuvan Barugu. The last time Mauna Loa erupted in 1984, lava got within 10 kilometers, or 6 miles, of the outskirts of the city of Hilo, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, though it took weeks to do so. Evidence of smaller-scale seismic activity has already been found in recent weeks. Last week, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory recorded approximately 113 small magnitude earthquakes below Mauna Loa, mostly concentrated below the summit and upper elevation flanks of the volcano. However, the U.S. Geological Survey clarified in a statement on its website that while rates of deformation and seismicity at the summit remain slightly above long-term levels, the Mauna Loa volcano is not currently erupting. I don't know about you, but when someone tells me a volcano isn't currently erupting, I don't feel that reassured. It's like someone coming up to you and telling you a ton of bricks isn't about to fall on your head. It's better than them saying they are going to fall on you, but you do have to wonder why they've brought it up. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.